For this yeasted stone baked bloomer recipe, you're going to need all your normal regular bread making equipment, plus a stone for your oven, a peel that looks like this, and a grignette. We spoke about all these things last week, but for now, roll that thing to. Hey home bakers, this bloomer recipe is made simply with a yeasted straight dough, not dissimilar, in fact exactly the same as the simple sandwich loaf recipe in my book. It's perfect for this and it's a perfect way to upgrade from your tinned loaf and start your journey into the world of stone baking. This recipe makes two loaves for double the practice and double the bread. You can half it if you want to and for me, it's likely going to take around four hours start to finish. Cut to the table. Here we start with a large mixing bowl. It's a pretty simple affair if you've seen this already with me. I've left timestamps down below so you can skip this bit if you want. So that I'm adding 14 grams of fast action dry yeast and 640 grams of room temperature water, which round these parts is around about 21 degrees C. Once I'm happy the yeast has softened a little bit, I'm gonna add to that 900 grams of strong white bread flour and 100 grams of wholemeal bread flour. Next comes 16 grams of fine sea salt. And with my dough scraper, I'm gonna mix it all together like this. As it comes together and you start getting messy, make sure you've got a dough scraper scraper on hand so you can scrape off your dough scraper and keep it clean. And also your fingers too over there on the side where you can see is my dough scraper 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 in case the second one gets messy. <laughs> When it's all come together and there's no dry flour left, then add the olive oil. 30 grams is enough. If you like to and you want to and you like the feel of it, you can dimple it in with your fingertips. On this occasion, I just kind of cut it in with the side of my dough scraper to mix it all together. Then when it's all in there, turn it out onto your table, cleaning out the bowl, make sure everything's nice and tidy and you've got all the dough that you measured so well out of the bowl onto the table. Eight minutes of light kneading is gonna be plenty to turn this sticky dough into a nice smooth and bouncy ball. I don't know whether to linger on this for too long because you've seen it a bazillion times that I've done it. There are videos of me doing this in full elsewhere you might wanna have a look at if you haven't seen it yet and if you're new. Once that eight minutes is up and your dough is looking better like this, then you are done. Put it into your bowl, a little bit of dust on top and a bake with Jack proving cloth and set it aside to rest for an hour or an hour and a half. Take some dry flour in your hands and use that to rub off any sticky dough stuck to your hands. You can get the tops and the bottoms in your nails, in your fingers, in your thumbs. Just try and get it all out before you go to the sink because if you go to the sink straight away, you're just getting a sticky oral mess. Use your dough scrapers to clean up your table and get rid of those crumbs. After an hour to an hour and a half, your dough in your bowl should look nice and lovely and puffy, just like this. If it has puffed up, the next time it's gonna puff up. That's the rules of the game. You've already won the game if it's puffed up here. Nice one. Shimmy your scraper down the side to loosen the dough from the bowl and turn it out upside down onto a surface. The top of mine was a little bit dry, so I don't think it will stick, but you can dust underneath if you want to. Now on the sticky side, I'm gonna cut straight down the middle with the flat side of my scraper into two half moon shapes, one for each loaf. You can weigh these and make sure the same if you want. On this occasion, I didn't bother. I just did it by eye. Now with your knuckles, press it down a little bit flat and fold it back up into a nice tight Ball. This is a straight bread recipe, yeah? We knead the dough, we let it puff up, we shape it, we let it puff up, and we bake it. That's it. Here what I'm doing is shaping it into a ball. And this is what I like to call the pre-shape. This is what bakers do, and I don't know why it's not in all recipes all over the world. You shape it from this weird half moon shape into a ball, let it rest again, and then we shape it again. And the point is, we're building additional structure here so it's able to hold a shape at the end. That's important because we're gonna stone bake our bread freestanding on the stone with no support, no tin sides, no nothing. Just the shape of the loaf and the tension you've built is gonna hold the shape on its own. This builds additional structure and it also helps you get a consistent shape because now you're shaping two loaves from two balls. So two loaves from two kind of loose half moon shaped pieces of dough, does that make sense? Fold your dough around on itself until you get a nice smooth ball like this. Cup and turn your hands underneath to just plump it up slightly. Let's count the turns on the next one, see what I actually did, shall we? On the second piece, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13? Why did I stop on 13? That's outrageous, apologies. 
Now you've got two nice, tight, bouncy balls. That's the pre-shape done. They're just gonna rest up here for like 10, 15 minutes just to relax enough to be able to approach with a final shape. If we try and shape it now, it's gonna to be too tight, too bouncy. It's gonna resist all of our efforts. Cover with the cloth while that happens. After that 10, 15 minutes, your dough would have spread slightly, you would notice. And plus, it's a little bit looser now, ready for the final shape. Shape them up one by one. Loosen the bread from the table with your scraper. Don't just pull it up and stretch it. You'll totally destroy what we've just created. Get your scraper underneath, flip it upside down, sticky side up. I want to shape this quite tight, so what I'm going to do is take my knuckles and push it all down. You'll hear squeaking and popping where you're getting the air out, basically. Tightening up the structure. Get your hands underneath the sides and pull them out slightly. Fold one side in and one side over the top. You'd have seen this loads of times. This part is exactly the same as when we're shaping a loaf for a tin. I wish on the day I did it slower so I could talk you through it a bit better, but hopefully you get the point uh, in what I'm trying to say here. Make sure it's wider at the base than it is at the top and use your knuckles to press it down flat all the way up to the top, like this. Really press it down, get it nice and tight. Take the top flap and fold it down, then in a roll push, roll push, roll push, roll push, roll push, all the way to the end, making it nice and tight. This is how I shape something for a tin, but for a bloomer like this, we need an additional step, which is a just a little palm roll. Roll it up and down the table, pushing that bit in the middle so it becomes more of a sausage shape instead of as plump as what it was before. Put your seam underneath, tuck it all in like that, and that's one bloomer done. Dust it all over, make sure it's not sticking to anything and put it to one side while you tackle the other one. Let's see that one in real time from another angle and hopefully I did this one a bit slower than I did the first one. Let's have a look, shall we? Now you've got your two loaves done. Don't worry about the outside ends. I never worry about stuff like that. Some people get upset by it. I really don't, I don't, I don't worry about it. I like seeing that spiral on the end. Liberally dust with flour a patch of your table because this is where our bread dough is gonna rest. We don't want it to stick to the table and suck up the flour. So kind of over dust this bit. We're not gonna use a basket or a banneton. This dough is tight enough to be able to hold its own shape while it proves up just here on the table, which is lovely. Pop them both together, clean up your side a little bit, make sure there's enough room in between them so they don't join up as they puff and cover with your bakery jack proving cloth for around about 45 minutes. If this was a loaf in a tin, here's what we would do. We'd prove it up till it was really massive and delicate and puffy. Then we'd put it in the oven, get a little bit of oven spring, like that, and then it would set a shape and we've done a lovely loaf, wonderful. This time we're stone baking our loaf and we kind of want that big burst on the top. Also, we need a little bit of tension so we can transfer it onto a peel and from the peel to the oven without losing any gas. If it was too delicate, too fragile, we wouldn't be able to do that without it collapsing. That's why the rest is only 45 minutes instead of a kind of an hour, an hour 15. While your loaves are proving up, get yourself a stone that we spoke about last week Pop it into your oven like this on the shelf. Also, you're gonna need a deep tray underneath. This is one I use for steam. That's why it's properly filthy because I always use it just for water. And preheat your oven to around about 220 degrees C, 230 degrees C, something along those lines. Hot, yeah? Like I said before, you're gonna need a peel to slide your bread dough off straight onto the stone. This might be the one that you're most familiar with. It kind of looks a little bit like a shovel. This one used for pizzas and round loaves and things like this. This is the Bake With Jack version available to purchase from the shop, obviously. Because we're doing two long loaves here, I like to use long loaf peels that I have created. I made, I made these, I know. I like to load them in one by one for maximum control because I feel like they might slide off the edges while I'm trying to shimmy them both in on a big giant peel. So get your two peels side by side. Get yourself a grignette, that's your razor blade you're gonna need for scoring. It's worth mentioning here, yeah, that I don't use a lot of 
special kit in, in the kitchen. I don't have a lot of different equipment for different things. It may seem like that because I like different pills and things like this, but some things are really helpful and worth getting. And that's why I have stuff like this on hand because you only got to get it once and then you go use it again and again and again and again. It's going to make your life so much easier and it's also going to make your bread so much easier as well. Lift the cover off your dough and see what's going on underneath. We can clearly see that these have puffed up. They've still got a little bit of tension in there as I press on the top of my finger, but they're not delicate enough that the slightest movement will encourage them to absolutely collapse completely and lose all the gas inside. We need a bit of bounce. We need a bit of push to get it to bust open nicely in the oven. Now I'm going to tip my loaf up on its edge and slide the peel underneath, rolling the loaf back on top so the top stood on the top and the seam is still underneath. Let's see the second one, shall we? Gently, gently does it. It's nice at this point to give a little dust on the top of your loaf so that when the cut opens up, we get that nice contrast between the white bit where you've dusted and the cut, which is beautifully golden. You can do that with your fingers or here, have this little kind of tiny little sieve slash tea strainer thing that I like to use to just get a fine dusting all over the top. Get your grignette to hand nice and ready, but before we slash, well, there's one very important thing we need to do, which is the shimmy test. Pick up your peels and give it a good shimmy. Make sure your loaf is not sticking to the peel because if you get to the oven at that stage after you slashed it and it is stuck to the peel, it's gonna be like a face in a hot oven stress time. When you're happy it's not sticking, hold your sharp blade to the top surface of the dough, not vertically down, an angle, a shallow angle, and slash in a straight line from one end to the other. I'm very conscious in class, it always looks like I've done a smiley face, like an angled curve cut, because that's what it looks like when it's opened, or at least what it looks like after it's relaxed a little bit. I always go straight from one end to another, straight down, slightly off center, straight down. Then return to the ends with the corner of the blade and just nick those pieces because that bit, if it's not cut, will stall the rest of it from bursting open nicely. Here's what they look like when they're done and you can see they're already trying to open themselves up. All we need now is the heat of the oven to bust them open nicely. Get your loaves over to the oven nice and close so that when you are loading, you're nice and close by. You don't have to travel the distance of your kitchen while all the heat is escaping out of your oven. Boil the kettle, ready to go. Open the oven door because I'm fancy. I can pull out that tray to show you exactly what I'm doing. Bring your loaf over and slide it off of the peel directly onto the stone like that. Put them both in one by one, side by side, with plenty of room in between so they don't join up like conjoined twins. Pour the hot water from your kettle into the tray beneath and close the door. Set your timer for baking. That tension that you built in the pre-shape and the shape, the fact that you let it prove up, but not all the way, the direct heat from underneath where the dough is in contact with a hot stone, the way you slash the top not too deep but at a nice shallow angle, all these things contribute in a big oven spring and the crust to burst open decoratively exactly the way that you want it. I baked my two loaves for about 45 minutes without taking the steam out halfway or topping up the steam or anything like that, just straight up 45 minutes start to finish till it's nice and golden brown. And here's what they look like out of the oven. You see what I mean about that flour, that little dusty flour, we get that real nice contrast and it looks beautiful. Now it looks artisan you can charge an extra pound per loaf just look at that crust look at that sheen it's properly crispy and golden it's well baked all through to the middle the second one incidentally it didn't quite open up on that back end which is weird my guess is that's where the fan is blowing so it probably dried out that area while i was messing about with everything else uh, and stalled that bit from you know bursting it's part of the game don't they look beautiful? That's a simple yeasted bread dough. And just by using a bit of technique, a bit of advanced technique, I suppose, but actually it's really quite simple to stone bake the loaves. We get a whole different look, almost professional baked by a real baker. And if you give that to your neighbor, I think they'd be well chuffed. In fact, one of the school mums on the drop off, which I did give one of those loaves to, was over the moon. Let's slice it up, shall we? And see what it looked like inside. Here we get a classic fine crumb texture. No big holes where your jam's gonna fall out and none of that nonsense. We kneaded it well, we shaped it well, we knocked it back well when we were shaping it up. It's hold a really nice shape and we get a real nice slice profile because of that. We get a bunny slice, you see, we get a bunny slice where everyone wants to see. It's nice and soft on the inside and crusty on the outside. It's perfect for your daily sandwiches, your toast, in the same way that you would use your tinned loaves. Uh, and there it is. Um, Stone-baked yeasted bloomer. Hopefully I made that sound easier than you may have previously thought. It's well worth it getting a few bits and bobs to start your stone-baked bread journey. I feel like it's natural progression once you start making bread and realizing actually this is really cool and you're well into it. The next thing to do is just get a few bits of kit and start stone-baking stuff because it is properly wicked. Very, very pleasing and very, very 
rewarding. If you didn't see last week's video on equipment, I was mentioning five pieces of equipment that's really helpful, some of which we use in this video. Next week, we're gonna have a look at this video in more detail to kind of dissect nine really important steps to make an amazing stone baked bread at home in a similar way we did to that tray bakes one in video one, seven, five. I hope you learned something from this today. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you to all Patreons for supporting this channel. Uh, and anybody who's made a one-off donation on the website, thank you so much uh, for, for everything. Uh, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. Simple as that. See you again very soon. Bye-bye.